Hey all, just a quick note to say how much we really appreciate you as a listener. And we know that you understand our needs to buy some string so that we can continue to fly this kite. So we went and made a Patreon. So please, help us out with as little as $1 per month. Simply search for Kites and Strings on the www.patreon.com site. You'll find that it really feels good to help us fly this kite. Now we know that not everybody is in the position to support us financially, and that's okay. Please tell your friends and follow or leave a nice review on sites like Apple Podcasts. That's really helpful and it really costs nothing but a few minutes of your time. Thanks and please enjoy this episode. Welcome to Kites and Strings, the podcast about creativity. My name is Steve Plume. My co-host, Catherine Shinnock, and I are both registered art therapists and licensed clinical professional counselors, in addition to being creatives. In this podcast, we explore creativity. We especially look at the tension that is often present for those who choose a creative lifestyle. Along the way, we interview fabulous guests who have found their own success living their creative lives. Our guest in this episode is Jody King. As her website says, she keeps it real and she slings paint on the regular. She also works with other artists, either just beginning or seasoned with years of experience by helping them create honest art or learning the business of art. In this episode, we're going to have a bunch of fun as we learn Jody's methods for getting a community of artists to grab their strings and to fly their kites, all while dancing and swearing in the splash zone. You do the online courses. Tell us about that. And did that come about because of COVID or is that something that you were doing prior or? Yeah, so I have been teaching in-person workshops for years and launched prior to COVID. So like October of 2019, I put together an online course called the Color Course for Rebels. And it's just about kind of teaching people the nuts and bolts that they need to know to create paintings, regardless of how it, you know, whether it's abstract or figurative or whatever their media, I mean, they're, uh, they like to paint, but primarily I, I taught workshops. I painted, I sold my work. And then when COVID hit a couple of the workshops that I had scheduled were canceled. One being in Sedona, Arizona. And if you haven't been to Sedona, it's, I've heard wonderful. Oh my gosh. Yeah. It's on my list for sure. It's freaking amazing. And so I was really bummed. I had to cancel that one. And then I also have one planned in Tuscany, Italy. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> wow. Not great for COVID, but like, man, how beautiful would that be? Right. We're, they're back on the on the books. I am going to go to Sedona in April and I'm going to go to Tuscany in June. But to go back to your question. So then I thought, okay, well, here we are. I'm going to have to pivot and pivot quickly. Mm-hmm. So I started going live every day, like the first of April on Instagram. And I mean, I have to probably do this for three weeks during mm-hmm. this pandemic. <laughs> <laughs> every like, day Jody every day wow was this to replicate like getting up and going to work okay so I am big on meditating and my meditation was what next what now and I just got stay visible and I was like no 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 I like I need something tangible so meditate again what now stay visible stay visible so I just thought okay I'm just gonna listen So I'm going to stay visible. That to me is what being visible was to get out on social media. But the funny thing is I thought the lockdown would be like three weeks, maybe four weeks, maybe really crazy six weeks. Right. And so I created content for about a month, five days a week, four weeks, like 20 different things. Mm -hmm. And then at the end of that, I was just like, yeah, I can't do this anymore. (laughs) I need to do something different. So, so what kind of content were you putting out Jody? And, And when you were coming up with those things, were you taking into consideration that it was like a a lockdown situation? Yes. So when I teach my workshops, I don't teach people how to paint like me, which is a a lot of times when people go to workshops, they're like, oh, I Mm -hmm. love this artist's work. I want to take her workshop to learn to paint like that. I coined a term called honest art. Mm -hmm. And so what I help people do is I help them create the work that only they can make, honest art. My view on it is if you're being called to create something, you're not really being called to create something that's already been done in the world. Do something that only you can do, whether it's a poem or it's a song, whatever it is, 
that's your honest art. And yeah. for visual artists, it's called abstract expressionism, right? It's been around a long time, but I just kind of made it a little easier to understand. Basically, it's kind of turning yourself inside out and putting yourself on the canvas uh -huh. and whatever that looks like. And so sometimes that looks like absolute shit. And sometimes, because that's how you're feeling and that's okay. Yeah. And yeah. sometimes it's flowy and beautiful. So to the question of like, what was I teaching? I, I would talk about honest art. I would talk about how you can go from meditation to journaling and get it all out that. And that's based on Julia Cameron's The Artist's Way. Yeah, yeah. So I talked a lot about different things, but one of the things I would always say is, okay, what kind of questions do you guys have? And occasionally there would be around the honest art thing, but I think sometimes that can feel a little esoteric. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. And people started, I noticed that they were, understandably kind of scared, particularly people that wanted to make art a career. And they're like, holy crap, like galleries are closed down. My exhibition is not going to happen. My, what, you know, how am I ever going to sh show my art again? And so the questions that I was getting was more around art business stuff. Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. So I started, well, you know, I was just going to answer all of those questions and I've been doing this 18 years. So you know, that's one of those things like you don't really know what you know until somebody asks you a question like, oh, I know that answer. I know that one too. And that mm -hmm. one. So I knew I was getting a lot of these sorts of questions. They just kind of blew up in April. And so in May, I launched a, I called it a high touch, low tech mastermind of the business side of the art business. And just took, I think it was initially 10 people. Then the next time I did it, it was 12 people and now it's 11 people. So it's this real sense of community. And we just cover 12 weeks of everything from mindset. And I talk about all the woo stuff and uh -huh. energy experiments, just kind of pro proving that what we put out, we attract. Yeah. It's okay. a mind blowing book. So we talk, we start with mindset. We move on to our why, which is, can be difficult for artists to get, you know, what is your why? And Cause we're just like, well, I just want to, I just want to paint. I just have to, mm -hmm. but we dig a little bit deeper into our why. And then we move into like how to apply to galleries and how to create a sales plan. And sorry, I went on. No, that's great. Because there's a lot of things that you said there, which was great. And I got a couple notes here, but I like what you said about, you know, some of it's going to come out of it and it's going to be shit. Yes. And being okay with mm -hmm. that. If you come in with those preconceived notions that you're going to put out something that is going to be beautiful art, then you might be setting yourself up for a, a bit of a crash, whereas it's better to just let it be. It's going to come out like it's going to come out. Absolutely. Last Tuesday, I was on the local NBC Austin affiliate, and we were talking about the process of doing that and how healing it can be, just mm -hmm. because to create honest art is to really interrupt the stress cycle. So there was recently a, a book written, two sisters, oh gosh, and I'm not remember it. And Brene Brown talked about it and um, it's called Burnout. They talked about how we don't burn out because of stress, because stress is a three-part cycle. The initial thing that causes the stress, maybe like, I don't know, pandemic, <laughs> you know, <laughs> or something. Maybe a little right? thing like that. Just a little thing. <laughs> And then the second part of the cycle is that it gets into our body. Mm -hmm. That's where the burnout is because yeah. the third part is when it moves through. The book talked about like seven different ways that we can move that stress through our body and creativity was one of them. To me, the best way to do it is to paint the shit. It's to get whatever, you know, if you're, if you just need to scribble like this and, or whatever it is to move that through. Are you guys familiar with Basquiat's work? Yeah, yeah. Mm, yeah. 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 I mean, I think he's the perfect example that work of processing emotion, processing experience. And that to me is honest art. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So we're both art therapists and essentially that's like what it is. It's honest art as the art therapist, kind of helping someone cultivate or navigate that process, opening the doors, encouraging that process, not interpreting that in any way and kind of helping a person heal themselves through that work. Turn yourself inside out and put yourself on the canvas. I love that. 
it, it ties into the like making ugly art thing, acknowledging and accepting that you're you're not always happy, you're not always perfect, and you can hold two really complex and really seemingly opposite experiences at the same time within yourself. And if you give yourself permission to put that on a canvas or put that on a piece of paper, then you're still you're honoring those parts of yourself. You're honoring the air quotes good parts and the air quotes bad parts at the same time. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I I feel like we're all just a kind of bunch of contradictions mm-hmm. <laughs> and yeah you know if somebody asked me about myself I think that's what I would say I was like I'm a complete contradiction from one moment to the next and mm-hmm. just allowing those like you said to to hold space at the same time and not judge it yeah but for so many people they start creating art because they want to make pretty art yeah right. yes there's an expectation yes What we're trying to do is just create a conduit for stuff to go from the inside to the outside. And I think that one of the things that stops a free flow in that are little brain chunks, right? Little brain chunks that make us think about what we're, we're putting out there. And that's where the fear comes in. That's where the expectation of quote unquote pretty art. And that can just follow up the whole mat, the whole thing. We hope people can get past those brain chunks and just let it flow. But I agree. And I think that's what stops a lot of us me included, Mm -hmm. from stepping up and creating sometimes. It's because our brain chunks are like, what are you doing? It's just going to be ugly again. It's, you know, why even bother? And it's going to be stressful. And, you know, you're a hack. I mean, all of the things that uh, we tell ourselves, even, I mean, I, 100% of the time, 100% of the paintings that I paint, um, I go through the whole cycle of, you know, hopefulness to despair. (laughs) (laughs) Wait, wait, wait. What's the cycle? Hold on, Jody. I want to know what the cycle is that also in- that includes hopefulness and despair that shows up in in paintings. Like what else yeah. is in there besides hopefulness and despair? <laughs> right. <laughs> well, so I didn't come up with this, but I, I saw it about 10 years ago and I keep it next to me when I paint. But it's six stages of the creative process. Mm-hmm. The first stage, number one, is this is going to be awesome. Right. <laughs> the second, yes. second stage is this is tricky. Mm -hmm. The third stage is this is shit. Mm -hmm. The fourth stage is I am shit. Mm -hmm. You know, we take Mm -hmm. that on. Mm -hmm. The fifth stage is this might work. And the (laughs) sixth stage is we're back to this is awesome. Very cool. Very cool. I love the exploration about how one turns themselves inside out to put it on a canvas and the idea that it might be great or it might be shit. I also love the six stages, and moving forward, we're going to explore how Jody pulls it all together. We're also going to explore the idea of me on psychedelics, Jody in her whoopee, and an unexpected tattoo. Do you think the business of art introduces some brain chunks? Oh, a hundred percent. Okay. A hundred percent, and it's not a good thing. Vera Wang, somebody asked her years ago, because at the time she was the only bridal house uh, in the high fashion industry that was still independently owned. And they said, how is it that you can run this business and still be so creative? And she said, on the days that she has to write the checks and run the business, she said, I couldn't design a white t-shirt. So she makes a shift in her brain. Yeah. You kind of just have to compartmentalize it. The business stuff And for me, I work on the business stuff until about two, maybe three. And then I turn that off, take a break, and then I spend time in creativity. But it's hard sometimes. Well, I think that's an interesting point because you bring up the clock. That the time that shows up on the on the clock, it says, "Okay, this is the time where I get to shift off, switch off this part of my brain." And there might be other people that might use other things. I mean, I've I've known Mm -hmm. people that use clothing. Right. When I wear this, you know, when, when you switch over into this. I thought you were going to say mushrooms. Oh. <laughs> well, I'm sure. People do use mushrooms. That was going to be the third one. <laughs> I want to see. The so clock. now what I want to see, Steve, I want to see your clock wearing attire and your mushroom eating attire. I, I, I have just created the two ultimate Steve's yeah. in like Wall Street suit and like fucking like psychedelic bell bottoms <laughs> with a like headband across your forehead. <laughs> you know, it's funny. Cause yeah, now that I'm thinking about it, I've done some experimentation. I've never done shrooms. Well, there's, there's always, always time. time. <laughs> <laughs> 
So, <laughs> but yeah, I mean, you can really fuck shit up if you do shrooms oh. while wearing a suit. <laughs> <laughs> right, because then you're like weaving these different, different like zones, head spaces. Oh my gosh! I'm stuck. I'm stuck in my own little like <laughs> visual world of you in a in a suit first. Yeah, I don't do that very well either. <laughs> Certainly, one of the things that sounds like you know that you contend with. Right. Exactly. And to to speak to the clothing thing, I have what I call my wubby. It's a in fact, if it's all over my social media, but it's a, a navy blue and white plaid checkered flannel top and uh-huh. I put that on every time I paint and it's like Superman's cape mm-hmm. you know it's like okay yes. now this is on now we now it's time to play yeah. so I'm sorry to digress no that. that's great oh, that's what you were saying but- I love the I like that you use the word play when you did yeah. art workshops before was it very much that? Was it the let's? So I think I read something. It's like let's get let's get messy and use swear words or something like that. <laughs> <Are> we- <laughs> yeah, yeah. We'll dance. We'll probably dance. We'll definitely swear. You know what? I when I'm put together the workshop, I always let people know you will be in the splash zone. Mm-hmm. Wear clothing that's not precious. It's all about play. It's, you know, from an energetic standpoint, that is the highest you know, the highest energy is that play. Mm -hmm. And if we can get back into our bodies and just have some fun, we crank up the music and we just get after it. We'll do, I'll, I'll put a big uh, canvas, like, and we all get in there and we are, we've got paint all over. It's so fun. The music's Mm -hmm. going, you know, it's that high energy empowering Mm -hmm. experience and it turns ugly a hundred percent of the time. Yeah five to 10 people working on one canvas, it's going to get, it's going to follow the exact stages you, <laughs> you listed. I have done this before. I never with that many people. I think my most has been five people on one canvas and it always gets brown. <laughs> <laughs> it, the inevitable. Exactly. And then it grows out of that too. Exactly. And then we work our way out of it. So, fun. Yep. so yep. fun. And maybe this is the art therapist side of me, but is there ever a time where people throw things out and then it scares them? Have you ever had that experience? I haven't had an experience where that I have been able to see that people mm. are fearful. I've had many experiences, as I'm sure you guys have as well, where they're really surprised yeah. about what has come out. Yeah. Yeah. And it'll lead to tears and you know just real mm. emotional experiences at every single workshop. And that's really, that's really the breakthrough, I yeah. think, into yeah. that honest art. It's, it's incredible. The process, it's the best job ever. There's this one woman that took my workshop and on the last day, they're usually four day workshops from like nine to four. And on the last day she says up and she says, I just want you to know, I'm going to be leaving early 70 years old. And I was like, she said, but I'm going to come back. So, okay, no worries. And she goes, I'm going to get a tattoo. (laughs) Love it. (laughs) Love it. (laughs) I'm like, what? She goes, it's my first tattoo. I'm so excited because she just had this empowering experience, right? It's That's so fun. Yeah. Yeah. I love it's that. It's the best. Right? That's so cool. That's so cool. Mm-hmm. Next up, we're going to hear about an amazing revelation. Paintings of sassy housewives in and out of their underwear, the fear of being found out, boning up and developing art knowledge, having a more sophisticated palette, and finally, the unfettered brain of child artist. I think I read that this whole idea of doing art came to you later than what some people might imagine. Yes. When and what were you doing before and what triggered all of that? Just unpack that for us. You said such a good question. So I was 35 and... I was doing some creative things. I was doing some interior design for a local home furnishing store where I lived. So there was some element of creativity, but for the most part, it was a paycheck. And I was raising young kids. I had a, uh, at the time I had a, I think I had a seven-year-old and a three-year-old. I mean, Mm -hmm. it was just, it felt very like constant giving, constant giving. And uh, one New Year's Day, there was a group of us together we, we were sitting around saying, what do you want to do for the new year? And one of the uh, men that were there was there was an artist. And I looked at him and I said, you know what? I want to paint. And he said, so paint. <laughs> and this was before YouTube. 
and I had not gone to art school. And I go, oh, no, I don't know how to paint. And he said, so paint. And I go, I, <laughs> I don't know it. how to paint. He's like, all right, how about you do this? Go get some paint, go get some brushes <laughs> and start <laughs> painting. And it really was revelatory to me absolutely revelatory that I could just do what the hell I wanted to do just because I wanted to do it. So I, I, so here's what he said. He said, well, what do you want to paint? And I said, you know, I've always had this idea of painting women saying really sassy things. It's not surprising if you know me. So, <laughs> <laughs> so that's what I started doing. I started painting. Uh, the first painting didn't turn out terrible. It was a still life of some flowers and I was really pleased with myself. So I just started, I just kept painting and I painted things like, because I was at home with young kids, I painted a woman and it said, Penelope wore nothing but a thong while folding the clothes to remind herself she was more than a mother. Mm, and yeah, and, and I wrote all kinds of sassy things like, you know, so-and-so refused to wear panties to the country club because she was in it, but not of it or, you know, things like that. <laughs> and so then my house was on a tour of homes, not because it was grand and fantastic, but it was just a little bungalow that we had redone. It was real cute. So mm -hmm. it was on a tour of homes and my paintings were on the walls and people kept coming in asking who the artist was. And I'm like, get the fuck out of here. <laughs> <laughs> this is all you about know? me just having a cute home. You <laughs> <laughs> This was about me picking up the stuff off the floor and putting it somewhere for this opening, right? Just so I have to put it somewhere. And so they started selling. I sold two paintings that day. And one of the people that came through was, owned a store. And then she asked if she could start carrying my work. And that's how it happened. Wow. It was wow. just, and then of course, I was scared to death because a lot of people were like, oh, that's amazing. But the truth is I had no idea what the hell I was doing. Mm -hmm. So I had to start getting some books and I had to start really understanding more of what, you know, really what the hell I was doing. Why? why? Well, Jody, why did you feel like you had to, cause it sounds like you had this just innate inspiration and you made these, these paintings that, that were appealing to people. But as soon as they got picked up, you're like, Oh, I guess I better get my shit together and learn how to like be an artist and how to be a painter. Like what made that transition happen for you? Total imposter syndrome, absolute imposter syndrome. They're like, I'm going to be found out. I'm going to be found out that I actually just started painting six months ago. It's just all going to go to hell eventually unless I figure it out, right? That's what I'm telling myself. Uh -huh. So that's one of the reasons why I created the course that I created is because I put together all of the things that I wish I had known when I started mm. so that people would not have the same experience. During that study period, what happened to your artwork? Um, it got better. It did get did better. It. Okay, good. I was wondering if that would introduce brain yeah. chunks. Right? Yeah, no, it got better only because I continued to paint what I was painting, but I knew why it was working. Okay. okay. So for instance, your brain sees values, the lightness and the darkness of color before it sees color itself. Okay. And okay. so if you paint straight out of the jar or straight out of the tube, 90% mm -hmm. of the time, unless you're using like white or black or like a light, light, light pink, 90% of the time, the stuff that's coming out of the tube is medium values. Mm -hmm. So when you look at a painting, so I'm new, I'm a brand new artist and I'm painting straight from the tube. That's like what everybody does. And sometimes it's working and sometimes it's not. So when I learned that it's all about values, having light values, dark values and medium values, then I could create work that was more appealing. And I still was creating the stuff that I wanted to paint. It was still sassy saying, so it was still women. It was still all of that. And then it just evolved. But it gave you a more complete palette. Exactly. And a more sophisticated palette. Yeah. I, you know, I think the narrative you were telling yourself like, oh, I just started painting and they're going to find me out that I, I'm new at this, you know, is I think insecurity that anyone has when they start a new career or a new experience. For sure. But, uh, you know, when I look at it, a painting in a museum, the last thing I look at is, well, okay, how long had this artist been painting? Like, it could be their very first painting or their five millionth painting. And to me, it, it's not about the level of experience. It's about what the work says to me. I'm saying that because I want, like, I want us all to erase this. You have to have been doing it for a long time to, to be able to impact people with it. Because I think that's bullshit. 
A hundred percent, a hundred percent. And in fact, the mastermind, the art business mastermind that I, I do is a application based program. And people are always surprised once the group is put together, there'll be women in there that have painted two months, started painting two months ago mm-hmm. and women in there that have been doing it for 20 years and it's the person and it's what they're creating. And that that's what matters. It, has, it doesn't matter at all how long you've been doing it at all. Yeah. In fact, don't you yeah. just love children's drawings and things? There's nothing better. Absolutely. Absolutely. I have a, a, an old friend of mine who's an art teacher actually down in Texas and, and every now and then she'll show a picture of some kid's artwork and she'll always add, I have the best job in the world. It's like, <laughs> that's how I feel. Yeah. So it's, it's yeah. Cause it's so much fun. It's so it's un, un, unfettered. It's unfettered by the frontal cortex. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Because kids are just, they're, the way their brains are developed, they haven't developed as much of the bullshit that we as adults have. And they can just be, I think, a little bit more free and less concerned about what other people are thinking, less concerned about other people's opinions. And it really is just a raw expression. So have you heard this about this study that was done where they, whoever they is, but they went into yes, they. the kindergarten <laughs> classroom and they said, everyone who's an artist, raise your hand. And a hundred percent of the kids in kindergarten raised their hand. That's Good. So cool. <laughs> and then, and then they went, they did, did it to a third grade classroom. Okay. Everyone here who's an artist, half the kids raised their hand. Yeah. And then they went to middle, middle school. Yeah. Everyone who's an artist, raise your hand. One kid raised their hand. Oh. It's heartbreaking. Well, I love what you were saying, even in this business class. I would imagine a lot of people would think, oh, there's a bunch of like seasoned folks, but that you have some folks that have been doing this for two months and they're like, fuck it, I'm going to I'm gonna try to see if I can't sell this stuff. I mean, that, Absolutely. that, that is so cool. It's so baller, right? Right. right? Yes. And I'm so thrilled that you're helping facilitate that. It's not unlike the message you first got, which will go paint. Yeah, just go paint. <laughs> Now we're going to step into the Wayback Machine to learn a bit about a crappy message from an art teacher. We explore representational work versus abstract work, and Jody's transition from one to the other. My discussion reminds me of an old art education theorist, Victor Lowenfeld, who was in my Wayback Machine. He spoke of kids being visual artists, meaning they were skilled at depicting things accurately, or haptic artists, which included those who were more emotional and connected with body sensations. For adults, who are a completely different animal, I've come to believe that some can tap into both, and Jody might be proof of that. It will also make so much sense, given the life events and needs that Jody mentioned having that brought her visual and haptic bilingualism to the fore. So you... You were interior design and you did, you were in a creative field, you know, I mean, was there a period of time where you wouldn't have raised your hand or had you always kind of thought, yeah, I'm kind of a creative person. It just happened to go into this, this more controlled kind of path. Well, I loved when I was a kid, I was really, really creative. And in third grade, I had this art teacher and the the lesson was we were supposed to create a a mushroom out of clay and we were Mm going to paint it and have it fired in the kiln and like it's really really exciting so I I made my mushroom and I painted it but I had all these extra bits of clay and so I rolled them up and I made little balls and I put them on top of the mushroom and I painted them different colors etc and then off it goes and you know the next week they return and the teacher hands me my mushroom and told me that that was not part of the assignment (gasps) and in that moment I realized I am not an artist. I'm not creative. Wow. I never forgot that. That, That's when I put my hand down. Wow. Till I was 35. I was a dancer. So I feel like that became kind of a creative outlet. But in in that moment, I decided I'm not creative and was never that person that drew or did anything like that. I just had decided I was not creative. Wow. Yeah. You know, Mm -hmm. it makes me so sad because I feel like that story that you just told, I've heard it a bunch of other times. Like a friend of mine, when he was in like kindergarten, painted trees that had like red trunks and blue tops. And the teacher was like, no, 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 no. That's browning. That's supposed to be brown and green. It's it's just unfortunate that art teachers aren't teaching creativity, at least historically. I mean, I don't know. 
know, we've, we've definitely talked to some art teachers through the podcast who are now practicing and definitely thinking more expansively. But when I was a kid, it was like, no, you, you're, you, you have to paint things realistically that look like real things the right way. Well, I think that's what happens in third grade and then subsequently middle school, yeah. right? There becomes this expectation yeah. that an artist is somebody that can make something look like something. Exactly. And that there's rules as to how you do that. And that's the thing that just kind of squishes, that just pushes all the, the art out of, of somebody or the creativity out of somebody. And, and it doesn't have to be, you, you know, that type of art where it has to look like something. Well, Steve, I think that is the reason that I, when I first started painting, I painted things that looked like something. And mm-hmm. abstract art, I didn't get it at all. It was, I, was, I was one of those, anybody can do that. <laughs> And then you start to do it, and you're like, <laughs> I love that you're saying this. And what people can't see is that Jody is surrounded by her beautiful abstract paintings. I mean, she she looks like it was like a murder scene of paint. Like you were in there, like <laughs> like serial killing all of the paint. It's everywhere, and then these beautiful abstract canvases. And you're like, yeah, you know. I didn't get it. I didn't get it. I get it now for sure. Now it's so funny because I teach people how to do that, but. Yeah, I mean, I just thought abstract art is silly, but now it's like, no, it's mm-hmm. kind of, it's really powerful. But yeah. it's that understanding. I'm going back to an old, my my undergrad was in art education. I remember this one guy did a an art lesson with young kids and I forget what grade it was, but he gave them a bunch of art history books. So go in and pick a picture that you hate the most. And then they pick their picture. And then he spent some time with each one of them telling them about that picture and that artist and why it came about. And then a week or so later, he gave them the same book and said, pick the picture you hate the most. And all but one kid picked a different painting. Wow. Mm -hmm. So this idea that once you learn and you understand and you get in there and you're in the weeds with all that stuff and you get it, that it it brings forth understanding and I think appreciation. Absolutely. 100%. Yeah. That was my experience as well. For me, I wanted to, representational art became a a bit of like a a straitjacket. And I was going Mm -hmm. through a very difficult time in my life. My my marriage was coming to um, an end, the family, it was a very stressful situation. And what I felt intuitively that I needed, I needed to sling paint. Like I needed a physical experience of the creativity. Mm -hmm. I needed to really process a lot of emotion. And that's when I started doing abstract art. Yeah. And you still do both, correct? Yeah, mm-hmm, I do. Do you feel like, not unlike Vera Wang when she's doing her <laughs> books, do you feel like you're making, you're, you're switching a switch when you go from one to the other? Yeah. Is it, it another part of your brain? Uh, it is. It's much more methodical because I do these other mixed media pieces that are so cool. Well, sorry, it's probably a little arrogant for me to say that, but they're, they're pretty darn cool. Wait, and, hold on, um, hold on, hold on, Jody, hold on. <laughs> I, you made it. I fucking hope you think it's cool because if you don't really cool. think it's cool, then why would I think it's cool? You fucking made it. So yeah, yeah. it's fucking cool. And no, it's not arrogant. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. No, I think they're really fucking cool, but they're very methodical in mm-hmm. the way that they have to be done. It's, it's a proprietary method that I came up with for doing it. There are times when I feel like, you know, when you swaddle a baby, yeah. they, it, it mm-hmm. feels safer. And there are times when I feel like I just want to work like that. It feels safer, yeah. more methodical. Yeah. And I'll do like two or three and I'll be like, oh, this is kind of feeling like an itchy sweater. And then I have to start, you know, slinging again. So I kind of go back and forth. Interesting. So many artists have that sort of dynamic. I'm thinking of a couple past, you know, Dome Moon, who will talk about the big, big brush strokes, and then she'll come in and do little details on top of it. And then somebody who was down in Austin for quite a while, uh, Jenny Mm -hmm. Hart, who considered herself like the big brush stroke at one point in time. And now she does these really cool embroidery things, which are to me the opposite yes. of big brush strokes. But she does these drawings and then she spends some real time digging into the lines that she puts in her patterns and, and turns it into embroidery. Yeah. Incredible. Pretty avant-garde stuff like sailor tattoos in embroidery and portraiture and embroidery and stuff. But well what what I was hearing with you, Jody, and one of the things that's come up with people a lot um, as we've been doing this podcast is people really liking to have some boundaries or some framework some kind of a box 
to work within. And it almost sounds like your very methodical kind of work is when you need to be in that box. You need that container. It keeps you safe. It gives you structure. It gives you order. And it gives you you like grounding. And so there's the box, but sometimes the box is too constrictive and you're like, fuck the box. And then you're all outside the box. But what I think is standing out to me is different with you is your process is the box, whether the process is the methodical organized, like it sounds like a step-by-step kind of way of doing things versus I'm just going to like what people couldn't see is your, her, her, Jody's arms are flailing. And again, I'm, yeah. I'm, a, I'm seeing the paint like shoot out of your fingers and all over the walls of your <laughs> studio. Yeah. And there's some on the ceiling. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, really, it's a splash zone. It, it is absolute freedom. That's yeah. what it feels like. Now, as I'm prone to do, I push to explore the idea that while building a business and carrying out very different looking tasks, we're scratching an equally valid creative itch. We also jump into parenting creative kids and we wonder aloud about how it is that the arts get such a bad rap when it comes to career choices and professional pursuits. I'm going to venture that as you're creating your business, as you're putting out your social media, and you're in the zone of getting stuff out there, that that's a creative process too, but there's no paint being flung in any way, shape, or form, (laughs) but it's still tapping into some part of your brain that is, I'm creating something here. A hundred percent, a hundred percent, because I I run all my social media, I write all my captions, I do all of that, and it's just like, you know, it's writing, right, and it's connecting. Mm -hmm. Mm Mm-hmm. So it is, it's all creative. It's all a creative yeah. thing. You know, like I, I posted a picture of me butt ass naked on the top of a, of a mountain where the sun was going down. And to me, that was, I posted it because I'm 52. And that was a moment of, that felt like total freedom to me. Yeah. And I posted it as a way of connecting to other you know, people that mm-hmm. follow me. And I, I have a lot of women, 40 to 70 that follow me and just to say, Hey, listen, we're not dead. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> 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 we, <laughs> all of my life. I own every regret. I own every mistake. I own everything. Mm-hmm. And here I am standing. And that's a form of creativity. It's contributed to who you are now. Exactly. So now you have two children, two yes. kids. Yeah. What do they do? Have you been <laughs> pumping creativity? I mean, so one is a writer. Yes. One is a writer. Uh, she's 22. And the other one went to university for musical theater and is now a comedian. I so love it. both daughters are creative. And I couldn't be prouder because, you know, they're just following their passion. And, you know, there's a whole, the whole starving artist mentality. There's not an industry out there that pr- promotes this idea of scarcity other than like the priesthood. Right? <laughs> I mean, anything you go into the arts, people are like, Oh, that's not safe. That's not safe. But I think if COVID has shown us anything is that what the hell is safe? Right. right. What is safe? Look how many of these very stable jobs that have just been flushed down the toilet because of COVID. There's nothing that's safe. I agree with you. There's nothing. And so do what you're, especially in your twenties. Are you kidding oh, yeah. me? You have no kids, you have no husband, you have no mortgage, do what the hell you want to do. And they'll figure it out. And and it it may, it may be whittled down into something that they don't love. And they later on, they, they open up an old part of themselves and they let it fly. Or maybe they just are letting it fly throughout. Exactly. I couldn't be prouder. Yeah. Well, and I, I think you're, you're right. It comes from that same energy that, makes those third graders and those middle schoolers not raise their hand. It, yeah. Right. Oh, this is something you can't do because it's not a real thing. Jody, I I'm zero surprised, but also really appreciative of you instilling that in your kids. And I think the more that we have things like this and resources out there for teenagers and middle school people and people in their twenties to realize like you can do and th- parents. Well, but, but that's just it. Like for parents to, for people to hear that the messages from their parents are not 
what it needs to be. Just last night, I was talking to two people in their 20s who are professional like trapeze coaches, trapeze artists. Both of them were saying how their parents were like, get a real job, get a job with salary. And when one of them got a job with a salary, she was so excited to be like, yeah, fuck you, dad. Look at me and my trapeze job with a salary and benefits. <laughs> so those things, those things exist. And I think we need to just as a society value art more and not have it be this, it's not a hobby. It's not a hobby at all. Well, and think how vast some of these fields are. If it's music or we've talked to people oh, yeah. in film and theater. I mean, yeah, you may get into something and maybe the, the image that you have is I'll be a movie star. And we know that there's a very small percentage of people that do that. But within that field, there's so many creative outlets that somebody may choose to follow. And they don't, they, maybe they didn't follow it from the get-go because they didn't know that field existed. Exactly. Just go in the direction of your curiosity, yeah. right? Follow that next thing and that next thing. And, and I know people have different varying opinions. I don't really have an opinion one way or the other, but I was just listening to uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger, uh, something he was saying, and he was said, do not have a plan B. I've heard that. Interesting. It, because if you have a plan B, you're not 100% going to go for your plan A. And so as a mother and as a creative person, what I'm trying to say to people is, Go with your plan A and bust your ass and make something of it. And if it doesn't happen, like you said, Steve, there's going to be other things that you're going to learn along the way that you're going to find that you wouldn't have found otherwise. And I don't know what it is about art that freaks people out. Because if you tell somebody whose kid is, a, is an athlete to not follow their dreams because the chances of them becoming a professional athlete is so slim, mm. th they still push it. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And then they just resent your ass for the rest of the right. life. Right. I mean, I remember as a kid, I wanted to be, you know, a tennis player and blah, blah, blah. And I was not, I was not that caliber by any means. At some point in time, we come to the, we as individuals realize, well, maybe that's not what I'm going to do, but there's this. And this, mm -hmm. because now that I've been introduced to it, it will be more than sufficient and maybe even surpass what they were initially chasing. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I think artists of all types are just incredible because it takes a lot of courage mm -hmm. to keep going in the face of everyone, including your most formative people in your life, your parents saying, that's not really going to work out for you. few more comparisons between the arts and sports, but I love the direction we go here and we might hear the possible beginnings of a new business venture. Hold tight. So this is a little bit of a tangent, but and an undeveloped thought. Um, had a conversation with another artist like yes this weekend about sports and I had this like revelation about we were talking about society and connection and like the, how we as people value either explicitly or implicitly connection to other people and I had this moment of like oh fuck that's why people love sports so much it's because I can say I don't know, I'm a fucking Yankees fan. And that immediately connects me into this community of other Yankees fans. And I can go anywhere in the world and say, I'm a Yankees fan. And someone else could be like, yeah, me too. And all of a sudden we're there. And I would love to cultivate, see, know how artists can create that same thing. I'm a painter. You're a fucking painter. Me too. That's awesome. What do you paint? Instead of like, oh, you're a painter. What kind of paintings do you do? Oh, you only do abstract expression. Well, you know, I do these realistic pet portraits. <laughs> like, <laughs> this is real. This is real, Catherine. What a, this, that's incredible. Because that is what happens. It reminds me a little bit of, again, I'm 52, and the way women Women used to be more, a, a lot more catty to each other. Yes, mm -hmm. absolutely. And now we're just like, uh-uh, I got your back. Hopefully that we can evolve as artists as well. It is about us as artists. And really, and I think, Jody, you're actually kind of doing that. It sounds like you're doing like group mentorship. You're creating cohorts of 10 to 12 people building this business mindset. And I think the more we can, can cultivate artist collective mindsets the more we're gonna get get some power over the sports a hundred percent and i'm gonna guess the people that come to your classes together leave and i bet the, they're they're contacting each other they've been in touch with each other afterwards absolutely yeah. that's the whole idea is to create a community of artists 
supporting yeah. artists. That's the whole thing. So I still go live every Wednesday on Instagram. And my whole intention when I go live is to teach something for free and to build a community to your point, Catherine, it's like, let's just create a collective story where it's about, if you want this, I support you hundred percent. You've revised my, and I'm going to say this. So everybody who listens can do this because we need all these things. So I had this vision, I don't know, when I was in college that I wanted to open Art Bar. And Art Bar was a place where the bar was in the center and you could go and order your like, whatever, vodka soda and take some watercolor paints. And then it was all about just having accessibility to art Mm -hmm. materials and creating a space for artists and non-artists to access materials. But now I want to expand it and it's a ring of studio spaces around it. And the studio spaces are not exclusive for like professional artists. Anyone can have a studio space. If you want to sling paint, you can't sit at a table and do that. You go to the paint slinging studio and take your vodka tonic over there and you do that over there. Or you take your lemonade. I don't fucking care. Drink, don't drink, have a coffee. (laughs) Catherine, this is brilliant. Brilliant. I hope someone does it. I don't, at this point, I don't have the funding for it. Maybe that's what I'll do when I'm 60. Maybe this is my revised (laughs) retirement plan. You know, (laughs) I will open art bar. I used to own a wine bar. Jody. That was one of my my previous careers Mm -hmm. is to own a wine bar. Now I'm like, oh, this sounds Jody, do it. Let's do it. Let's talk. (laughs) Let's make a thing. We've got a thing happening here. (laughs) That is really brilliant. Well, I think the more people tap into it and they realize just what you're trying to help people understand is if you just go in and let loose a little bit and yeah, maybe letting some alcoholic beverage flow through you will <laughs> you know, take away some, yeah, it'll loosen. Up. Or mushrooms. Mushrooms. Or mushrooms. Right. mushrooms. Right. So we got to do that up in table. Oregon right. then, right? I think they just legalized mushrooms. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, so yeah, somewhere it's, it's all soon. It's okay. South. Uh, <laughs> hopefully one person, two people, three people after hearing this will find some art material somewhere and throw it <laughs> onto something. <laughs> I hope so. And you know, I have said, I have made more fugly art <laughs> than anybody I know. And to me, that is the same thing as what uh, writer Anne Lamont calls the SFD, yeah, the shitty yeah, first draft. Yeah. You have to start, you have to start with the SFD and you have to start with fugly art. Totally. You just have to start. It's a straw man. It's designed to be picked apart. It's just a start. I used to do little art nights with friends who are artists and not artists. And what I would always say is just whatever, paint on the canvas. If you don't like it, we fucking gesso over it or we paint over it. So keep painting I over it. it. Nothing's, nothing's so precious. Your straw man is just your starting point. Your fugly art is just your starting point. That's right. And who knows where it goes from there and buckle in because it's going to be a fun ride. Yes. Yes, yes. Exactly, cool. for sure. So is there, what are, what's coming up next? I am taking this mastermind and I am creating uh, an online course because I want it available to as many people who need the information. So uh, I, I'm glad I started it the way I did. It's been a great community experience, but I want like the whole world to be able to have access to it. So that's going to come up in February. See, in April, I'll be teaching in Sedona at the Sedona Art Center. And we'll be taking all the COVID precautions we can so that we can be together. Uh, And then in June, like I said, I'll be in Tuscany. And in the meantime, just come, you know, I'm on Instagram Mm -hmm. uh, entirely too much. (laughs) In between, I'm slinging paint and uh, teaching people and creating just an awesome community of artists. Awesome. So glad to hear it. I'm thrilled to have you on. I think this was a lot of fun talking about art and and flinging paint and making fugly art. It was so fun. It's like I just hung out with three friends. I'm so glad. (laughs) That's so cool. I'm glad that I'm glad it's fun. That's one of the things I think is is cool about our podcast is is we get to we get to have fun together. Absolutely. (laughs) Thanks, Jody. Thank you so much. You're welcome. You guys have a fantastic week. Stay healthy. Bye. Yeah. Okay. Bye. 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 It was so much fun talking with Jody, who seems to have a blast with what she's doing. Such a great example of someone shifting gears later in life. 
and throwing herself all the way into their creative life. Learning to love and embrace even her fugly art. Her idea of creating a community of artists who support each other is way cool too. She's all over social media, including Facebook, Instagram, and Pinterest. And you can find all of those handles on her website at www.jodyking.com. And Jody is spelled with an I and an E. Also remember that the Kites and Strings website is www.kitesandstrings.com and recommend us to your friends. Please rate us wherever you podcast because it really does help. And also drop an idea or a comment via email at kitesandstringspodcast at gmail.com. You can also find us on Facebook and Instagram and newly Twitter. And we also have a YouTube channel. The Kites and Strings theme music is by Harrison Amir. Other original music is by Purple Planet Music at purpleplanet.com. Today's episode was produced and edited by me, Steve Plume, at Turning Stones Counseling Inc. Be safe.